Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Professor Richard Donor, Professor of Political Science at Emory University. Professor Donor's work focuses on variation in economic development, especially upgrading and innovation. Um, he specializes in the study of institutions, including business associations and public-private sector networks and politics. Although his geographical focus is on Southeast Asia, he has also looked at the interaction of markets and institutions in U.S. cases, including the emergence of the auto cluster. So from my conversations with Professor Donor, it appears that he is quite familiar with the state of Michigan. Um, I looked, um, looking at Professor Donor's CV, um, I realized that his education is very interesting. He has a wide range of interests. He got his BA from the University of North Carolina with a minor in French. Uh, subsequently, he uh, did his MA in international relations with a major in Southeast Asia, and then went on to study East Asian studies with an emphasis on China. And then finally today, he is one of the best known uh, experts of Southeast Asia, uh, focusing on political economy. He's the author of many books. He has written The Politics of Uneven Development, published by Cambridge University Press, From Silicon Valley to Singapore and Driving a Bargain, Automobile Industrialization and Japanese Firms in Southeast Asia. Uh, we are delighted to have him today to talk to us about his most recent research, which is on the politics of the middle income trap, comparing growth in the Malaysian and rubber sectors. So please put our hands together and welcome Professor Dona. Thank you, Yuen. Thank you guys for, for coming out. Um, it's been quite some time since I've been here, it's a pleasure, um, as I was telling my colleagues, my son graduated here many years ago, went to BRC, um, and loved this place, so, uh, and I've been back a number of times. So, this talk is really a combination of two talks. Can you all hear me? Do I need the mic, or should I? Ah, so this, oh. Oh, that's okay, this is, don't worry about it. I'm fine like this, yeah. Um, so this is really kind of two talks. Um, one is kind of um, builds on this work on the middle income trap, and the second um, kind of piggybacks on that to look at ways out of the middle income trap um, by looking at a comparison between Thailand and Malaysia in general and something, uh, a sector on which I'm sure you're all fascinated and interested in the rubber sectors. Turns out this is actually pretty important because uh, Southeast Asia is the source of the largest, uh, these are the largest producers of rubber in the world. So tires, anything that you use, medical gloves, it's pretty, it's pretty likely that it all comes from Southeast Asia. So um, I'm a political scientist, as Yuan said, and I'm interested in the political origins of the middle income trap. And here's the basic arguments that, that I'm going to make. Um, one of the questions that we have, if you look at the literature from The Economist, the question, it's, you know, we know what to do. And there's never any real answer to, well, why is this thing a trap? Um, and our argument that uh, a colleague, Ben Schneider, and I um, have, have made in a recent article is that it's due to a lack of coalitional demand for the kinds of things that are required to overcome this trap. That is, you have to improve productivity. What do you do to, over, over, to overcome, pro, to improve productivity? You do X, Y, and Z. So do it, okay? Um, our argument is that that's not sufficient, um, that there's a lack of demand, and that that lack of demand is a result of prior development strategies that has resulted in fragmentation of society, okay? And that we're going to look at this. I'm going to look at this through, um, as I said, upgrading efforts in Thailand and Malaysia, and particularly in uh, rubber, and a focus on a particular set of institutions, public testing and research inst uh, institutes. So first, I want to go through a critical review of this middle income trap literature, and then compare Thailand and Malaysia rubber, and then talk about these public testing and research centers as, to, as an explanation for how you, how you explain, how you account for the differences in these two countries and then some ideas about the next step. So first, just a couple, a couple um, comments about the middle income trap. What this, there's a huge burgeoning literature by World Bank, by IMF, by Asian Development Bank. Chinese are talking, everybody's talking about the middle income trap. And basically what it means is that the countries, that there were countries that were in the middle income 
in 1960, and based on historical experience, um, so they, they were here, and they should all be up here. But very few of them have come up here. Most of them stayed in here, have been in here, and have stayed there. So that's the puzzle. Why has that happened? Um, and the fact is that very few have, have made it where they should have based on historical experience. As you can see, um, Taiwan and Korea, obviously we could put in Hong Kong and Singapore for those. So that's the puzzle. Why are these countries staying when they moved into middle income, which is basically two to $12,000 per capita a year, and they haven't moved? So, and it's a theoretical puzzle for any of you guys who are econ majors because um, there were there were economists predicted convergence, right? Um, there's something called the Lewis, uh, the Lewis turning point where there's supposed to be uh, exhaustion of supply of labor coming in from the countryside. You have um, short supply in manufacturing. Wages are supposed to go up. Productivity is supposed to go up. Skills are supposed to go up. Uh, Simon Kuznets also said, you know, there should be reduced inequality as you move beyond middle income. Um, but instead, what you find in these countries is sustained inequality, slow or stagnant growth, uh, productivity problems, and they find themselves in what's called the nutcracker. That is, they are no longer low wage, but they don't have the technical capacities to compete with the high skill uh, high productivity economies of Northeast Asia, Korea, Taiwan, et cetera. So the question is, why is it a trap? And as I said, if you read the literature, the writings by the economist, it's very clear the problem is productivity, this nutcracker effect, as I mentioned. And so there's all kinds of policy remedies. What do you do? You improve research and development. You educate people. Especially, you develop technical and vocational training as well as good property rights, good labor markets, and things like that. And there's, if you read this stuff, there's a little bit of discussion of, oh, you need a bipartisan or a broad consensus on doing this. But they're economists. They don't deal with that. They assume that that will happen. Um, but it's not enough because everybody's talking about it. And if we know how to get out of it, if we know what the policies are, why don't smart leaders do it? Why don't they adopt these policies and implement them? And the fact is, as one recent review said, there's no theory about why and how middle-income countries can be different, okay? So our argument is that there's a lot of gaps in this literature. One is that to, to implement education, vocational education and R&D is very difficult. It, it's institutionally tough. And there's, I'm not going to go into these, but it's just an a, a couple of, of things that you should be aware of. So when in, whenever anybody says, oh, let's implement this policy, you need to say, what are the particular difficulties of implementing a particular policy? So for example, how long is it going to take? Right? How, how long does it take before you see the fruits of your investment in this thing? Right? How many actors are actually involved in this? If it's one actor, if it's a stroke of a pen, we're going to devalue relatively easy, right? If you have a lot of people having to coordinate their, their, their actions, that's going to be more difficult. If there's a long implementation chain, education reform, as we know in the United States, is fiendishly difficult for that reason in part. Um, how much information do you need? And by information, I'm, not, I'm talking in part about technical information, but even more is site-specific. It's one thing to talk about vocational training in Singapore and some of you know that you have ties and Malaysians go to Singapore, they go to learn about the Singapore training system, bring it back, doesn't work. So you have to know about site-specific situations. Um, these things are very complex. Um, there are winners and losers in education reform. If you put all your money in vocational training, what's that going to mean for universities and people who want to get PhDs? Okay? And finally, sometimes these things are not highly visible. It's one thing to build a school. It's one thing to build a road. You can see it, right? You can point to it. Political leaders can say, see, I did that for my, for my constituency. Uh, education reform, a curriculum reform, how do you see that, right? So these are difficult. They're, they're particularly difficult. Um, and so 
they, they take strong institutions. A second gap in our view is that you know you need institutions for this. Institutions are designed to solve collective action problems such as these measures. But it's hard to create efficient institutions. You don't just snap your fingers and all of a sudden you've got a good association or a good network. Um, it's a collective action problem in itself. And the question that we want to ask ourselves is, why would smart, politically sensitive leaders spend all the time to build institutions that are effective? And one of the terms that is often used is that it takes long time to build good institutions. You have to make intertemporal bargains. You have to make bargains with actors that last over time. But the fact is, is that many, most political leaders are interested in short-term benefits, short-term interest. So the, it requires pressure. It re requires broad coalition uh, support for this. And the question is, who's for this? Who's actively for this? And what we know is that historically, when you have good technical training, good education, good R&D, it comes from social pacts, from coalitions um, within business and between business and labor and other, other factors. So, that, and so there's a big literature that some of you may know on corporatism, right? Um, this is coordination among key actors for the broader good. Where do these pacts come from? In, South, in, in these middle-income countries. And our argument is that they're not there. They're not there because in the past, in order to get, and I'm simplifying this argument, in order to get into the middle income, most middle-income um, countries have relied on foreign investment and cheap, often informal labor, increasingly informal labor. So the result is interests are fragmented. Business is fragmented between foreign and local sectors. Labor is fragmented between formal and informal or organized and unorganized workers. And overall, these countries are fragmented by social inequality. And the result is weak institutions. In other words, no strong support. So you get into middle income, and these are, the, these are the conditions that result, but you, what you do is you need high institutional capacity and there's a mismatch between the conditions that are created by this, by the movement into it, and the demands for moving further out. Okay? There's another gap in the middle income literature, and that is the assumption of most of this literature is that the um, is that the external environment is conducive to improving productivity. Um, that if you have competition on, your, on local firms, they'll become better. If you link up with global value chains and multinational corporations, multinational corporations have expertise that will spill over to local firms. Okay, all that sounds good and maybe, and maybe quite uh, familiar to those of you who are looking at development economics from a neoclassical perspective. But in fact, it often, not always, but often does not work that way. Um, multinational corporations don't generate spillovers in many situations. Um, they may transfer innovations, but not the process of innovating. They may train people, but they do it at home or in their own firms. So they don't necessarily they're not necessarily interested in promoting broader education, right? They tend to be what Albert Hirschman years and years ago said, mousy. Um, Hirschman was responding to all the literature on dependency and said, multinational corporations are taking over everything. And his line was, wait a minute, they're not involved enough. They do their own thing, right? So it's an interesting, and, and in general, we found this to be true. And also, today's development context is, com is what people have called compressed, that product cycles are very fast and don't really allow a lot of time for local firms to learn how to do stuff. Um, there's weak linkages, people, firms get into parts or slices or niches of global value chains. And then there's, in many cases, growth of what are called dual workforces. That is, um, and this is especially, you can see this in Thai and Chinese auto firms, is that 20% of the, of the workforce in a lot of factories will be skilled, permanent workers. 80% will be contract, unskilled, 
right? So you split these. You have a fragmented workforce. The point here is what's important for us is this. It reduces the potential for social pacts, for coalitions in support of these broad uh, public goods like services like education, vocational training, um, and research and development. And so um, we, in, if you're interested in the paper, there's data in terms of comparing today's multi uh, middle income countries in terms of foreign investment, degree of informality, um, inequality. So um, I'll be happy to share the, the paper with you. You can get it now. Um, so this is kind of depressing in a lot of ways, right? What do you do? You know, we wrote this, this thing and people said, well, you know, okay, so you just sit there and wh what's going to happen? What do you, from the perspective of research and policy potential, what do you do? Well, one of the things that one should do, I think, is look for not outliers but for variation. Look who does it better, even among the middle-income countries. Who does it better? And what can we learn from that so that this is not an entirely bleak picture? And so you can first of all look at cross-national variation. <clears throat> and one is between, and again, my, the focus here is Thailand and Malaysia. And Malaysia, in terms of per capita GDP and a lot of other, uh, um, a lot of other indicators, has done better than, <clears throat> than Thailand. <clears throat> Malaysia is at now at, allegedly at 11,000 per capita GDP. And there, uh, the IMF said Malaysia is on track to achieve high income status by 2020, um, as many of you know, there are big problems in Malaysia. Um, um, reliance on oil, uh, education scores are weak in many cases, a lot of, of exodus of, of highly talented people, some of whom may be sitting in this room, for all I know. Um, and when you look at Malaysia, there are a number of conditions that would lead us to predict that. right? Basically, labor is less fragmented than in Thailand, that 80% of Malaysian work, workers are in the formal sector. Now, a lot of those are migrants. Any of you who spent time in Malaysian factories will know. Um, whereas in Thailand, less than 50% of the workforce is formal. There's a lot of informality. Um, inequality is lower. The work of Eric Kahunta has built on this, lower inequality in Malaysia. and at least up until recently, <clears throat> one has seen a relatively high level of elite cohesion um, that is represented by United Malays National Organization. Kahunta talks about this as a kind of hegemonic pragmatism that obviously is cross-class and to some degree cross-ethnic. Whereas in Thailand, interest groups are tremendously fragmented, the bureaucracy is fragmented, the parties, um, as Dr. Hicken has documented, are poorly institutionalized. Um, resulting in a policy environment where needed public goods, reforms, and investment are chronically un undersupplied. So that's a good thing to some degree. There's also, you can look at bright spots in terms of sectors, and that's what the focus of this paper really is. And if you look around the world, there are parts of middle-income countries that have really done pretty well. Um, software in Argentina, anybody who's ever drank a Malbec um, will have tasted the fruits of innovation. Um, in, um, in particular provinces in Argentina, Brazil, Embraer, some of you have probably flown in these planes, um, ethanol in Chile, very successful aquaculture uh, development, and in Malaysia, electronics in Penang, and our interest, rubber, rubber-based products. So, then, so we're going to look then at what's going on here in rubber and compare it Thailand um, and Malaysia. So first of all is I want to emphasize that Thailand is really strong in a number of ways. Um, also, let me emphasize that, as I said before, Malay uh, Southeast Asia is the source of 85 to 90 percent of all natural rubber in the world. So it's, that's where the game is played. By it. Vietnam is coming on, but Thailand is the biggest, Indonesia is next, Vietnam is coming on, as I said, Malaysia is fourth. Um, and on, but um, Southeast Asia is really where it's at, and Thailand is the top by far. Um, Thailand is also strong, not just in terms of, one, one of the ways it's strong is that it cultivates a lot of land, but it's good in terms of yield, that is how much rubber do you get per hectare of planting, 
And as you can see, you can see here, um, Malaysia was top for a long time. And then in the 80s started um, falling down and now Thailand, which is the biggest producer, um, Cote d'Ivoire obviously is good, but it's a very small producer. But Thailand is, is really the top in terms of the efficiency in which it grows rubber. Not just how much, not just the, the land, but in the efficiency. Where I want to emphasize is that Malaysia is strong in innovation. So a couple, and I have spent more time in rubber plants and talking to, in rubber fields than, than I would have ever imagined. But I ended up really kind of falling in love with this and realizing that this is just fascinating. And what you do is you break up the value chain, you look at the, cr the evolution of this thing, and you see that Malaysia has done things that are, in my mind, truly innovative. One of the things that they've done is they have moved, they developed what is called block rubber from sheet rubber. Instead of sheet, this is the way rubber used to be produced, and it was hard to, for the tire companies to evaluate the quality. Malaysia developed this approach. It's nothing fancy, but it took real innovation in terms of processing, okay? <laughs> Thailand followed, but was basically copied Malaysia. It was Malaysia that innovated this, right? So I want you to focus on innovations. Another thing that Malaysia has done upstream is that it's created environmentally green rubber products that can be used in roads and tires and stuff that are much less wasteful of the environment. It has processed, it has developed new approaches to processing rubber. And again, Thailand has followed, it's just as good, but Malaysia is the one that started this whole thing. And Thailand follows, but, uh, but really doesn't produce the equipment. Now, I know that many of you probably, who cares about rubber? Um, but what's important about this is to see where innovations come in this very important industry. Um, and then what fascinates me the most is downstream in terms of rubber products. So what I want you to see is that, first of all, in terms of exports, overall, in Malaysian exports, it's rubber products. And that's important. It's value added. What they've done is taken natural rubber or latex or whatever it might be, and they've used that rubber to produce manufactured goods. That's value added. That's development, right? Um, in Thailand, the dominant part of exports are unpro relatively unprocessed natural rubber. Okay, so that's really different. Also, in terms of they both ex export rubber products, in Malaysia, the emphasis is on gloves and industrial rubber products. And what's important for us is that the people who, the firms that do this are local. They're Malaysian firms. In many cases, Malay mostly Malaysian Chinese firms. Um, in Thailand, the main products that are exported are tires, condoms. They're the largest exporter of condoms in the world, dominated by foreign firms downstream, okay? And what that means is that Malaysia is much less um, much less uh, exposed to serious price volatility for natural resources, which is very, for, for unprocessed rubber. This, anybody recognize what that is by chance? Anybody from Malaysia here? Well, there's no reason. It's the second Penang Bridge. And the reason I have that there is that this was built, um, this is size, this is earthquake proof. It's, and it's earthquake proof, or hopefully, because it's built on seismic, uh, seismic dampeners or se seismic braces made out of hard rubber pioneered by Malaysian firms. Right? Nobody else has done this, really. So this is big stuff. All over California, you will find earthquake proofing done by Malaysian firms, and in some cases, in conjunction with UC Berkeley engineers. So the question is, how does this happen? Right? Hopefully, I've made a case that Thailand is really good, but Malaysia's better in innovation and productivity, right? So the question is, how has it come? How does that happen? And my argument is that p a big part of the answer is from institutions, specifically public testing and research institutes. And what these guys do is they provide early stage research and development. They help firms try stuff out and fail and learn. And if, you're, if you are a small firm or a medium-sized firm, you don't have a lot of labs, you need to go someplace to help 
you figure stuff out. Um, what they do is they really combine research and development and skill development. And they have all these specific functions. Uh, I'm not going to go down the list, but the only thing that I would mention here um, is diagnostic benchmarking, right? Is, is my tire as good as Michelin? And if it's not, what do I have to do to get up there? What kind of equipment do I need? How do I have to learn this stuff? How do I have to test? What kind of tests do I need? Just know, knowing what kind of tests you need is a real tough challenge for firms that are not huge. Okay? And what I want you to be aware of is that, and I was unaware of it, and I started, somebody started talking to me about this, and he said, you know, testing is really important for our firms. I thought, oh, that's interesting. I guess that's where you learn. You learn by testing and failing and trying again. And then I looked more deeply into the literature, and it turns out that these have been really important in, in the highly developed countries. Um, and I just mentioned a number of, a number of places here, but um, you look in the, ja the development of the Japanese auto industry, there were 180 industrial public testing and research centers in 47 prefectures in Japan up until recently to help small and medium-sized firms. So we know that where you find high productivity, you will find these things. We've had them as well. But certainly in the developed world, this is where it makes a difference. So what's the scene in Malaysia and Thailand? What I found, not surprisingly, is that Malaysia uh, manufacturers depend a lot. And what's really important is this, the Malaysian rubber board has all these labs all over the place. Um, and they are labs that help link the rubber tappers, the processors, the manufacturers, right? They're all trying stuff all the time. Thailand has the Rubber Research Institute of Thailand, of Thailand. It's mainly focused on cultivation and processing of upstream of natural rubber, but not downstream, not products. Uh, it's weak. They're losing personnel. Um, and there is this thing, and I, I cannot tell you, I have talked to the guy who's starting the Rubber Technology Center in Mahidon University, and I just feel so bad for this guy. He's trying, 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 and one of the things he's tried is to get money. Um, and so Thailand has a lot of aspiring tire producers that are trying to compete with some of the big guys. Maybe not at fancy, fancy car tires, but truck tires and other things. One of the things that you need is a test track big surprise. They've been trying for 13 years to get it and they finally just got approval and we'll see if it ever happens. But 13 years for the biggest rubber producer in the world to get something that will help its downstream producers. In one sense, that, that makes no sense. So the question is, well, actually it does make sense. Um, and so I'm not going to go through all of, the, all of this, but I just want you to, if you look at the supply side of this, what do you see? And what you see is um, first of all, in Malaysia, there is a national level coordinating institution, the Malaysian Rubber Board, um, that has been long established, that's got amazing technical, or is losing it, but it historically has had amazing technical expertise and, te te uh, and, and testing centers all over the place. Thailand doesn't have one, just doesn't have anything like this. Um, two th they've been trying for years, and in 2015, Allegedly, the Ministry of Commerce finally got past um, the rubber authority of Thailand or something, of something like that. We'll see if it, has, if it does anything. I'm, I'm quite skeptical. Um, for those of you interested in the politics of this, the ministerial oversight, what's the ministry over this? And what's really interesting is you compare the two. In Malaysia, there is something called the Ministry of Plantation Industries and Commodities. His, until now, until now, um, it is not politicized, right? These are technocrats who've run this thing. And their focus is on rubber as a feedstock, as a feedstock for producers, right? In Thailand, the there is no one ministry that oversees this. You have commerce doing exports, industry allegedly doing um, products, but they don't know anything about it, and their response is, it, it's, it's up to the Ministry of Agriculture and Cooperatives. So there's no owner. They don't talk to each other. Literally, they don't talk to each other. Um, 
and then as a result, you have very poor public private sector coordination, um, no exp and a lot of export bodies in, in Malaysia, very few, uh, very weak in, 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 in Malaysia. Um, so the demand side, and this is, I guess, one of the most important parts. Um, I've worked on business associations. For, unsurprising to me, I started, I, years ago, I started working on business associations. It turns out these guys are really important. They organize, they organize information for their firms, they put pressure, they bargain, et cetera. In Malaysia, they're very strong. They're impressive. Thailand, much weaker, and I'm not gonna go into the details. Um, but what's, Im what's also important here is that in Malaysia, the downstream, the products, the, manu the rubber manufactured products are very strong. In Thailand, they're very weak, very weak. Um, and one of the reasons they're leak weak is that in, in Thailand, the foreign firms, basically the, Mus the Michelins of the world, don't really participate in the associations. They send people, but they don't really do much. Uh, in Malaysia, it's the local firms that really are engaged there, okay? So key players. The last thing that I noted, when you go into these associations and you look who their membership is, the rubber products guys in Malaysia also have very close ties with the people who make the machinery that produces their products. So they may say, we got a new product, but we don't know how to make, we don't, we need equipment. And they bring in these capital goods guys, these, these machine tool guys, and they help them figure it out together. <clears throat> that doesn't exist in Thailand, or rarely. Um, the associations, I won't go into this either, but we can go if you're interested in the Q&A. The associations are way more active, as I suggested, in, uh, in Malaysia than in Thailand. Um, and I guess the most important one for our perspective is this, um, both of these. In Malaysia, they design, they do a lot of R&D, they do testing, research, they link up with the private sector, both of these. In Thailand, very little, very little. So I want to conclude here by just talking a little bit about the, the broader part of the demand side. In Malaysia, historically, rubber was based on a very strong coalition. Um, some of you probably know that rubber farmers were historically a key base of UMNO, uh, of the alliance and then the, 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 the BN. But it also helped and involved ethnic Chinese as well. Upstream guys, are, the farmers are less important. There's not as many Malay farmers doing rubber tapping at this point, but they're still important. In Thailand, farmers are still very important, uh, especially for the Democratic Party and now for everybody in some ways. But the downstream guys are not that important. They're foreign, they don't play in the game, or if they're local, they're just weak. Um, rubber is, natural rubber is important for both countries. Um, and I was at a meeting of a um, international rubber technology and economics conference. You wouldn't expect a political science to be hanging out there, but I had the chance to go, and I heard Prime Minister Mahathir give a talk. This was about four years ago. And he said, I want to acknowledge the importance of you guys. He said, when I was finance minister, um, or prime minister, I can't remember, he said, before we looked at the national budget, we looked at rubber prices. Rubber prices were key. Now, it's not as important. It's 5%, but you talk to Malaysian officials and they say, this is a safety net. This, is, this got us out of the 2008 um, uh, recession, it got us out of 1997, and it's still extremely important. And what's especially important is downstream products, the rubber products, not the upstream stuff. In Thailand, natural rubber is really important, but what dominates this is semi-processed natural rubber, that is, the sheets and the bales that I showed you earlier, right? And then the question, the other last question is, what's the, what are the alternatives? It's one of the things that I've been interested in. What are the alternatives to being, to upgrading, to be innovative in rubber? And Malaysia has no alternatives from its perspective. Um, every time they've had an innovation, it has been in response to crisis, to challenge. So. The block rubber that I mentioned to you earlier, that was the result of fears that synthetic rubber would, would, would come in and wipe out all of, their, um, all of their local guys, their local farmers. And again and again, that's happened, okay? Thailand, um, 
for at least up to now has been sitting pretty simply by pushing exports of nat of unprocessed natural rubber. And the biggest source of this, uh, not surprisingly, is the Chinese market. China is the largest consumer of rubber in the world. It's declined somewhat, but what you find is expansion of natural rubber cultivation all over the country, into the Northeast, the North, as well as historically the South, and much less emphasis on helping local firms to improve their capacity to produce products, tires, rubber bands, what rubber toys, all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of opportunities here. So the external threats and the challenges on these countries are very different. Thailand can rest pretty or has based on exports of raw materials. So that's basically the spiel. The spiel is where you, is that there's a middle income trap and a big problem here is lack of productivity how do you improve productivity? You get good institutions. Where do you get good institutions? From coalitions. Coalitions respond to threats in various ways. Um, and in Thailand, there's especially high level of fragmented interests, especially foreign firms that are there but don't really care about education and training except for themselves, right? So the question that we want to ask going forward is, does the argument work for other sectors? So, for example, Malaysia is great in, in, in electronics and uh, rubber. What's the deal with automobiles? Malaysia is a basket case with regard to automobiles, right? It's really been quite weak, whereas Thailand at one level is quite strong. They produce, Thailand is the largest pickup, producer of pickup trucks in the world. How did that happen? Okay. And then does it work? Does the argument work better for some issues, for some productivity measures than others? Is it better for vocational and technical training than for research and development? We can slice it up. And then the question is also, um, if you remember it, in the beginning I said the reason that you have this fragmentation is because of the way that these countries got into the mi to middle income to begin with. These are successful countries, by the way. We're talking about trap and most developing countries would give their eye teeth to be Malaysia and Thailand. These are diversified economies. They're really good in a lot of ways, but the high income, not so clear. So it's, are we right that this happened, that this, fragment, this fragmentation between foreign and local, informal and formal workers, inequality, is that the result of the way they got into middle income? And that requires a whole different, whole different um, um, set of research. So I'm going to stop there and welcome any questions that you have. I know I've thrown a lot out at people. So. Questions, skepticism, challenges? Yes, sir. I'm curious about the fact that Malaysia is more integrated. Thailand is less so. Integrated in what sense? Well, in the sense that you're talking about, that it's, that it's unified. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas ethnically, of course, Thailand is, is more unified in that way. Malaysia is, as we know, multicultural, multi-ethnic. Multi um, and sort of flying off from there, is it the Chinese aspect of the Malaysian part that makes it stronger? What, or in the future, is there a possibility of fragment, more fragmentation in Malaysia, more unified? Um, activity in Thailand? Um, okay, so th those are fairly big questions. I would say that what's interesting about this is that rubber really does reflect a, a um, cross ethnic coordination okay. right, in Malaysia, which does not exist in automobiles, obviously. And it's unclear to me if it really exists in electronics. Electronics is better, but tends to be much more Chinese dominated. Where Malaysia, uh, in rubber, Upstream and midstream guys are Malay. Yeah. Downstream guys tend to be almost totally Chinese. Yeah. The Minister of Plantation Industries has typically been run by either a Chinese or a Malay or Indian yeah. okay. or okay. Indian uh, technocrats. Yeah. And my argument for why that's the case is that rubber is so terribly important. Rubber okay. has really been important and they could not rely simply on the, on the export of natural rubber, which is unprocessed. 
sure. they had to rely, I mean, there was, a, there was a limit in terms of land and other things, and they moved into palm oil as well. Mm -hmm. And as they did that, the rubber products sector took off, especially these rubber gloves. So the, the largest, Malaysia is the largest producer of rubber gloves in the world. And so if you're going to produce rubber gloves at a level that the FDA will accept them, you have to have good inputs. You have to have good latex. So you have to work with the upstream guys. They import a lot of latex as well, but you've got to work with the upstream guys as well. So that means close links between the downstream Chinese and the upstream midstream. So Malaysia. a quality control is built into the system. Right. These are these are, and so one of the fascinating stories here is in the you know Malaysia started going gangbusters in um, in in medical gloves in the 80s and with with AIDS. So AIDS was a big market for Malaysian glove producers, and then. Uh, they were selling all these gloves, and what happened was Americans started having latex allergies. And this was a huge challenge. They thought, we are making tens and hundreds of millions of dollars out of this thing. We are employing tens of thousands of people. We're going to lose this whole market if we can't figure out how to make... Should I be doing here? Sorry. If we can't figure out how to make low-protein latex gloves. It sounds super technical, but way, the way they did it is they work together. They work with the Malaysian Rubber Board. Malaysian Rubber Board has testing centers. They work with the uh, with, uh, equipment producers. It was really, a, I think, a remarkable innovation, but it was under pressure. The Thais have never really had to deal with that at all. What's interesting is that with the increasing ethnic tensions and religious tensions in Malaysia and with the fragile base of, of UMNO uh, and the BN recently, even this industry has started getting more political. So the new minister of the Ministry of Plantation Industries is from Sabah, is from Sabah. He doesn't necessarily, there's no reason that he should be, I mean, there's now more, more, more rubber in Sabah and Sarawak, but this is clearly a political move by UMNO to make sure that they can keep, um, um, you know, Sabah and Sarawak together. So I was wondering whether the, uh, possibly the difference between Malaysia and Thailand that you talk about comes from the difference in the structures. So Malaysia used to have big plantations yeah. and then all were broken up and now That's left right. with a few and a lot of smallholders. That's right. So in the future or even now as things are going on, so this quality control of smallholders is going to be really difficult. They're able to maintain it better in plantations. That's right. I don't know if Thailand has big plantations or are they all smallholders. Then They're again, you have issues with uh, maintaining the quality. That's right. And I wanted to mention that one of the things that you say, they're rubber uh, in Malaysia is for boutique, they call it some of the big plantation firms, they call it boutique agriculture, they make hard bulbs. So the rubber is of such good quality. So they produce that quality rubber for hard walls for all the operations. So it's like inequality in the rubber sector. Yeah, yeah. You have this high quality and uh, less. Um, no, that's a very good point. Um, and it is true that most rubber in both Malaysia and Thailand is produced by smallholders. And for all of you students out there, I just cannot emphasize enough. I know it doesn't sound like, oh, I'm going to study rubber. This is really interesting stuff. If you care about development, you need to look at the politics of how these industries develop, right? And so one of the things, is, you're totally right, is that um, there, rubber is no longer an attractive thing for many Malays to do. Kids have moved into the country, into the city, and so they have low yield, and this is a big concern of the Malaysia Rubber Board, and so they are developing all these new initiatives to improve, make it more attractive, automated rubber tapping. They're still, they're, they're trying all this stuff out, uh, in part because it's been neglected because the big push was for palm oil. That was where the, the money and the attention went. Um, so they're very concerned about this, but, but Thailand has been historically quite good um, even in the smallholders, that's upstream they've been more effective recently in the last 20 years than Malaysia has been. The problem is if you go to the north and the northeast, the yields in Thailand are, are pretty low because those guys, they're in it to get rich quick, can't blame them, and they, 
you're supposed to wait five to seven years until you start tapping rubber. They're doing it three to four years. So the yield is very low. So it's going to be a problem for the ties down the road as well. But the efforts of the, the, the Malays are vi- Malaysians are very clear that this is a problem. How do we improve um, yield and production upstream? How do we get people to invest in it? But most is, is, is small, small holders. Yeah. Um, uh, so two puzzles um, jump to mind. So one is this issue of, uh, given the the coordination and the the level of in, the level of institutional development um, and investment that you that you point to in Malaysia, why the sort of continuing poor yields, right? Why why has that been an area where they've been able to sort of respond and in fact look like they've gotten worse, perhaps even over time a little right. bit? Um, and then second. Um, the, the, if we're thinking about sort of external threats that, that drive innovation and drive uh, and, and produce uh, co- you know, shared interests among coalitional actors, um, can you explain a little bit more why those have been more intense for Malaysia than Thailand? I would, th- I would think that, for example, China is available for, as an export market for both. So why is it that, that, that ties this was an exit strategy or a, a, a default strategy where in Malaysia doesn't seem to have been that? So talk a bit more about that. would be great. Um, so the first question again, you know, um, uh, why the, the, the continued poor yields in Malaysia, given the capacity and all, all these other areas you've showed, why, why haven't they been able to improve rubber yields? Um, I think part of it has to do with what um, I just said, is that, is that um, the, the exit of the plantations that were way more efficient, um, and it's something I don't completely understand, but my sense is that the plantations really were where the efficiency was, and much less so in the smallholders. So there must have been, I think, some reliance on the plantations, and then eventually they got out, and the, and, and the emphasis then was on smallholders. But there's not that many smallholders left. I mean, it's really people who are 50 years old and above, right? So that's a problem, right? You don't have as many young people who are as innovative, and some of the innovations that they have produced um, have not been taken up. Right? So you have it, whereas the Thais have a very good extension service. The Malaysian extension service, I think, was left to kind of uh, suffer a little bit over the years. The threat in terms of the opportunity for Malaysia to, um, you know, aren't, aren't, don't, don't they have the opportunity to export to China as well? They simply don't have the volume. They have moved so much into, um, into, pa- into oil palm, so much. Um, that they and the combination is that they don't produce as much natural rubber to sell, and what they do produce, they want to they want to use it uh, domestically. And you look at the Malaysian government plans, and they view rubber as part of movement out of the middle income trap. If you're going to do that, you have to make rubber products. That's where you're going to make money, right? Um, that's where you're going to innovate. That's where you're going to get good. And there's going to be all kinds of spin-offs from that, right? These seismic industrial uh, products that I mentioned, as well as rubber gloves. I mean, they are always moving. They're, o- they're running scared, right? And from their perspective, they don't have the option of e- just exporting natural rubber. They need it domestically. Um, is anybody else? Uh, the gentleman hasn't. Yeah, back there, yeah. Uh, so I see, like you trace the uh, different performance or strengths of the industry back to the um, difference in terms of coalition in each country. But I was wondering, can you talk more about like because coalition is also endogenous. So why there's difference or variation in terms of coalition in each countries? I guess the uh, it, that's the right. Where do coalitions come from? Um, the first thing I would say is that the coalitions are often sector specific. So we can talk about coalitions nationally, and we often do and should, but there are also rubber coalitions or automotive coalitions, right? And the way it emerged in Malaysia is that the big players were local. And the question is why, this is a, another <coughs> question that I've asked, why didn't the multinationals dominate the production of rubber gloves or these other things? And the answer I get again and again is that we Malaysian firms were more nimble, that we innovated more quickly in a tough market, whereas the big guys were clumsy and lumbering and they weren't willing to kind of 
play around with, with this new stuff. And in many cases, they simply ended up being buyers of our Malaysian stuff. So one question is, why are the multinationals so strong in Thailand downstream and weak in Malaysia? And that's the answer. I mean, I've asked this a lot. Um, so because the local guys stuck with it, and, you know, they can even run you down the chronology of, you know, Ansel and these other pl big players left. We stayed because that was the only thing we knew how to do, and we innovated, right? And now they're huge. They're huge. So they're an important economic force, and therefore they're an important coalition partner, right? And they're a force for R&D and technical training. The multinationals have left. The big tire producers do it themselves. And so in terms of actual rubber-related coalitions, it's Malaysian. It's Malaysian. Um, in the Thai case, there's a coalition, there's a Thai coalition, but it's only upstream. The big, there's what they call the five tigers. They're these big five, five exporting firms in Thailand, mostly from the south. And they are the processors, they run the growing, they organize the growing, and they export. They have the power because as I said, Thailand has lived well off of the export of natural rubber, unprocessed. So they've had, they've had success. They are the dominant interest. They are the big coalition guys <laughs> right there. So some of it has to do with the origins of the way the, the industry has evolved, whether there's local versus foreign dominance. But part of it is how important a particular sector is or part of a sector is to the national economy. So what you see in Thailand is when the rubber prices drop, rubber prices drop, so they're making, they're making, each farmer is making much less money. You have massive demonstrations by rubber farmers. Alan knows this, right? They, they demonstrate, they're real strong, they come from the south. They may, and so the, um, there are two responses by the government. Usually the government's totally befuddled, doesn't know what to do, right? They say, okay, we will put a floor on the price. We'll subsidize prices. Um, the other thing they do is, oh, you know, we should use rubber downstream. We should use rubber in roads. We should make tires out of our own rubber. And they think about it for a month or something like that, and then they forget about it, right? Um, because where the main coalition has been is upstream. That's, there's, there's no institution set up. Whereas if rubber prices go down from Malaysia, that's good. That's good because they can import cheaper latex for their gloves and their condoms and everything else, right? So it's a long-winded answer of saying we have to look at the sector. Now the in interesting question you're raising is, is the broader coalitional fragmentation, political coalitional fragmentation in Malaysia going to undermine what has up to now been a fairly productive sectoral coalition among key forces? Are the downstream Chinese uh, uh, Malaysian Chinese firms going to be alienated? Are they going to be, are they going to lose out because the minister is now much more of a political appointee? That's the, the interesting question. The overlap between national coalition and sectoral coalition. Just a brief question. It would seem very logical then for the downstream Malaysian firms to link up with the upstream Thai firms and develop an integrated system there. And indeed, that's what they've done. So what you find is more and more Malaysian glove guys um, setting up in southern Thailand or on the border so they can get latex is, you know, it's liquid. There's different forms of natural rubber, but they use liquid latex. These are dipped rubber things. They dip the stuff in, in, into uh, liquid latex. But you have to be, it has to be really good, and you can't wait for a long time because the stuff will settle, it gets all screwed up. So indeed, they have developed links with Thai suppliers. But what that means is that the Thai upstream suppliers do not then develop links with the Thai downstream guys. That's the danger here. In Thailand, also, there's this argument that Thailand Ben Put Gan Mung is a, is a rubber product, is a political product. And by political, they know that, that if you mess with the rubber prices, you're going to suffer. There's going to be big demonstrations by rubber, rubber farmers up there. Um, it's political in Malaysia, but in a different way, in terms of a core structural, the need for downstream exports.
Thank you, guys.